off yesterday, we had defined many, many uh, new terms, and we had looked at that idea of stereoisomerism, where molecules differ only in the geometry around a single carbon atom, and that in order to do that, you had to have four separate things attached to carbon atoms. And we also said that it's very hard to represent these molecules. And so what we want to take a look at is how to represent stereoisomers, or how to draw stereoisomers. So if you take a look at a regular tetrahedral geometry, a, a lot of times we're going to draw it kind of like this, right? Where we have A, B, C, D, or something like that around the molecule, right? So we're drawing a 2D representation. What does it really look like in three dimensions? Well, if I hold up this molecule, kind of like this, maybe turn it sideways for you, it kind of depends. Notice that two of the atoms are kind of out front, and two of them are back and forth, right? And we also know that if we have a big enough molecule, and we don't rearrange it, that it has that zigzag shape that we're always drawing, right? And so what we're really doing with the molecules when we draw them is we're putting the uh, stuff that's, you know, these things are coming out towards us, and two of them are going back. So sometimes you'll see representations like this, where they'll draw a chiral carbon like this, and they'll make, say, thick bonds like this, and maybe I'll put a chlorine and a bromine for fun. And then they'll make kind of these shaded or lined bonds. Let's see, what else do I use? I can use a fluorine and an iodine. And that's supposed to represent things going into the board. And these would be projecting out of the board. And so we could try to draw molecules, you know, if it's just a single molecule, probably drawing it like that wouldn't be too bad. Other, or too hard. Otherwise, if we're drawing very big molecules, turns out that they're kind of, you know, difficult to draw. And so we have what we call Fisher projections. And we'll see Mr. Fisher next chapter also when we start, start, start talking about carbohydrates, because we draw the Fisher projection of carbohydrates quite a bit. We don't tend to draw the Fisher projection of very many molecules past that. So this chapter and the next chapter, for the most part. And the general rules are we put the most oxidized group at the top. Now, that if there's no group that's clearly the most oxidized group, like for instance, if I have fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, they're really not oxidized. There's no way to calculate their oxidation numbers. Or even if there is, uh, they all have the same oxidation number because they're all you know, minus ones normally. And so for the simple molecule like I have drawn off to the left, we wouldn't do it. But you know, if I have functional groups like an aldehyde or a carboxylic acid or a ketone or just a methyl group or a, an OH group, we can calculate the oxidation for that. And maybe as a reminder, how, what's the easiest way to tell oxidation? It's not really concentrated, though. We use we use the we use the brackets when we were drawing chemical reactions like this to usually say the concentration of something. The brackets when they're used on a reaction arrow like that are simply used to enclose whatever's a, re, is required in the reaction, but we're kind of not keeping track of. Uh, so for most oxidized, yeah, it's it's uh, lose electrons as oxidation, but we also said we gain bonds to oxygen. So if you're kind of looking at it, the least oxidized thing would be just like CH4, right? And then we can have things with a single OH group, and then a carbonyl group, and then things like a carboxylic acid where we've got two oxygens, until finally we get to actually CO2, which basically has all bonds to oxygen. So when you're drawing these molecules, you want to kind of orient them so that whichever one of those functional groups is present and is the most oxidized one is at the top. We're going to show examples of this, so don't worry. We'll have plenty of practice drawing this in this chapter and in the next chapter. Then we zigzag, or well, I guess we go up and down, is where we put our chiral carbons. 
and that all chirocarbons are shown as crosses. So that means that we've got a chirocarbon there. Non-chirocarbons are generally written as carbon. So an example of that would be, and I've got to be honest, when I'm drawing them, if I know what I'm drawing out in advance, I might make something different. So like, say, if I put that at the top, that's an aldehyde group, right? And then I might put an HO and an H and, you know, an HO and an H. And then say this carbon wasn't chiral, what I usually end up doing is going back and drawing over it. So say that chi carbon's not chiral because it's got two, a, a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Or if the next one isn't chiral because it's got two hydrogens, we might just draw it like that. And then if we've got a bunch of carbons at the end that aren't chiral, we might do something like, you know, just draw them out as a giant tail. Meaning we don't tend to draw carbons that are non-chiral as up and down. Now these rules are a little wishy-washy and for the most part, we're going to be drawing the same types of molecules over and over again. So even if we get to something that's kind of an exception to the rule, we're not going to worry about it too much. So Fisher projections are the way that when we care about whether something is a stereoisomer or not, stereoisomer, ugh, stereoisomer or not, then we'll draw it out like a Fisher projection. Sometimes we'll draw molecules like normal and simply ask, you know, is there a chiral carbon there? And we won't care about the types. So let's take a look at some examples. So I have this molecule here, which I guess if we name that, that would be 2-butanol just for fun and practice, right? Are there any chiral carbons on it? So what's the, well, here I'm not even drawing a Fisher projection, am I? I'm just drawing some random molecule and saying, is it chiral or not? So what's our rules for a chiral carbon? So the first thing you have to be able to do is ID chiral carbons, right? And so that was what we talked about yesterday. That was, it has to be tetrahedral, meaning we can't have carbon-carbon double bonds or triple bonds on the carbon. And it has to have four different groups, right? And then the last one we said, and I put a star on it because we won't see it until a little bit later, is it ha can have no additional planes of symmetry. Additional, whatever, planes of symmetry. So are there any carbons in this molecule that are tetrahedral. Well, actually, first off, let's just look at it. All the carbons in this molecule are tetrahedral, right? Is there any carbon that has four different groups? <coughs> Hint, there has to be one, otherwise I would need to use it as an example. So if I number my carbons, one, two, three, four, just like I was naming it, which one's chiral? Yeah, number two, if I take a look at that carbon, really has a methyl group on one side, an ethyl group on the other, CH2, CH3, an HO group, and an H. So we could draw it a number of different ways, but that carbon is chiral because it's got four different things. Now, I drew the carbon chain going left to right because the OH group was pointing up, and I'm not too worried about it right now. What about this molecule? And I'll number my carbons, one, two, actually, well, yeah, I'll number them like I'm actually naming it. Be smart, right? Three, four, five, and then we'll call that six and seven just so we can talk about all the different carbons. Are there any chiral carbons in this molecule? I got one person flashing me a sign. They either think it's carbon number one or they're pissed off at me. Yeah, so carbon number two, notice, has a methyl 
a chlorine, a hydrogen. And then I've got to be honest, if it's something complicated, meaning that's got a propyl group with an ethyl group on it, instead of writing that out, I usually just write R, because that's obviously different from the methyl, the chlorine, and the hydrogen, right? Are there any other chiral carbons in this molecule? So three kind of looks like it might be chiral, but why is it not? Yeah. What? No, it is. I mean, it's got a hydrogen there, right? So it's got four things. We just don't draw the hydrogens. Yeah, four, not because it has a CH2 on each side, but because four and five is an ethyl and six and seven is an ethyl, right? So if I looked at carbon number three, which is not chiral, just to be obvious, it's got an H, well, it's got a, oh, uh, I guess we're not really going to draw it like it should be, I guess, just because it would be too much of a pain in the ass. But it's got a hydrogen down here, and then it's got an ethyl and an ethyl. And since those two ethyls are the same, it's not chiral, right? So you have to be careful, uh, especially, we're not just comparing the carbon that's immediately next to it, we're comparing the entire chunk that's on that side of the molecule. What about this molecule? And I have no idea. We'll just number it like this. I think we'd end up numbering it like that. I mean, I don't even know if I could name something that's got an aldehyde, a ketone, three OHs, and a CL. Mostly because we didn't even talk about the priority between aldehydes and ketones. And so, you know, we can draw lots of things we don't want to name. So which carbons are chiral in this molecule? Number five is not. Remember, it has to be tetrahedral. So this is trigonal planar. Therefore, no. Meaning it has to have four bonds. So which ones now? I heard a yeah, two, three, and four definitely are. Because they've each got an H and OH and ugly chunks of the molecule on either side that are not symmetric, right? Carbon number one has got a double bond, so it can't, right? And carbon six has two hydrogens on it, right? So remember that rule. Go through the molecule systematically and say, do I have, first off, tetrahedral? And then second off, say, do I really have four different things and I'm not being tricked because it, you know, looks funny? Like, you know, if you have something like this, is this chiral? Yeah, because the only one that even comes close to having four different things is that one, but the ethyls on both sides are the same, right? Now, if I do this, suddenly it is chiral, right? Because now I've got an ethyl on one side and a propyl on the other side. So now that one is chiral. So, you know, there's some practice on the homeworks for this. So, you know, practice up on it, I guess. Yeah, so can you spell our three? This one right here. So if I pull that out, there's carbon number three. The H and the OH are pretty easy to see, right? Maybe I do it like that. And then on the right-hand side, uh, you know, I've got two carbons, right? But on the left-hand side, I'm going to have one, two, three. So if nothing else, that's why they would be different because, and like I said, a lot of times we just start writing R and R prime if that junk is ugly and we don't want to keep track of it. They have to be in order to be chiral, right? It has to be four different things. And so by having four, three carbons on one side and two carbons on another, that would be different. It's also sufficient to just have something like this. How many chiral carbons are on this molecule? Yeah, carbon number two is chiral, right? Because it's got a bromine, a hydrogen, a methyl, and a bunch of garbage, right? And carbon number three is also chiral because it's got an 
chlorine, a hydrogen, an ethyl, and then an ethyl with a bromine on it. And so an ethyl with a bromine on it is different than an ethyl without a bromine on it. So if you think about it, if you went back through all your old homeworks, I'll bet you there's a lot of molecules that are actually chiral that we could have talked about, right? But we weren't concerned with whether things are chiral back then. We're going to be concerned moving forward kind of whether things are chiral or not. Or at least we're going to want to recognize that if things are chiral, it makes the chemistry and the biology a lot more difficult. Okay, so now that we can recognize chiral carbons, how can we tell if molecules sort of are the same or different when we draw them? For instance, if I just draw and pick two completely random molecules, we said that we can have blue, yellow, green, and red, right? And if I just randomly switch those, are those the same or different? Here's the trick. Remember how hard it was to tell just look? I don't even know. I literally randomly drew those. So you could be right. You could be wrong. I haven't, I haven't checked yet, right? When we, drew, when we looked at the models, it was the same. Well, from far away, they were very hard to tell, right? You had to physically overlap them to decide. So there's two ways to decide if the things are the same or different when drawn on paper like that. And we really only have to worry about that for small little molecules like that. Once the molecules get pretty large, it's pretty easy to tell if they're the same or different usually. And the idea is that if I can make, okay, so the one, one method that your book talks about, talks about rotating at 180 degrees and whether you can pick things up out of the paper and all that shit, I think the book method sucks. Okay, because it's too confusing. I find that students have a hard time remembering the 180s and 90s and stuff like that. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to swap groups. And if we have an odd number of swaps, then the molecules were different. And if I have an even number of swaps, then that means the molecules are the same. And since this is a 50-50 thing in life and Jay's having a tough morning, odd equal enantiomers, even equals same molecule. Yep. Good, got it right. That's another 50-50 thing in life, left, right, up, down. Although up and down I've kind of gotten pretty good at. The left and right still confuses me an awful lot. Well, so I'm going to, so what I'm going to say is like, for instance, if I want to make the first molecule look like the second one, right? So the red's in the right spot, right? But the yellow is in the wrong spot. So I'm going to swap, say, the yellow and the green one to put the yellow in the right spot, right? So that would be red, yellow, green, blue then, right? Now green and blue are also in the wrong spot, right? And so, but if I swap that, then that molecule would look like that, right? It would have the red and the yellow in the right spot and the green and the blue in the right spot. So I did two swaps. Therefore, the same molecule. Now, like I said, when I originally drew them up there, I had no idea if that was true or not because I literally randomly moved things around. And it kind of makes sense. And I, like I said, I should have grabbed the, my second model. But if we lined up the models, what we notice is that, like, say, the red and the blue would line up and the green and the yellow would be on opposite sides, right? So if I physically remove the green and the yellow, that would change the molecule, right? And then it would be a different molecule. But then two swaps, if I switched them back, that would indicate that it was the same as the original molecule that I had built. And so we can kind of use that as some simple rules to do that. Okay, the other thing then we can realize is that Well, actually, let's not do it that way. It's just easier to start this way. Enantiomers. So how did we define enantiomers? So you're getting this stuff twice, so hopefully it's going to sink in. Uh, how do we define them at first? They're stereoisomers that what? Are mirror images, right? but they're non-superimposable.
And then we define another term, diastereomers, as stereoisomers that differ by the orientation around one chirocarbon. And then I guess we should also maybe make one more fact known, stereoisomers, or the number of stereoisomers is 2 to the n. So that means where n is equal to the number of chiral carbons. Meaning that if n equals 1, there's two stereoisomers. If n equals 2, how many stereoisomers are there? God bless you. So if n is 2, then 2 squared is? This is the most math we have in this class so far, just so you know, right? Well, OK, I guess technically you had to be able to count to 10, right? Because you had to be able to, you know, say, you know, methane, ethane, propane, and stuff like that. What? Stereoisomers. So that's the number of stereoisomers. Sorry, I was being lazy. So sometimes I ha this helps people figure things out. So here's a Venn diagram. Here's stereoisomers. And the idea is that some stereoisomers are enantiomers. And then the rest of the stereoisomers, another giant chunk of, chunk of them, are called diastereomers, right? And then I'm going to leave this last chunk empty. I guess I'll put it down there. They're called meso compounds. I don't know why they don't call them mesostereomers other than the fact that they're really not stereoisomers if they're meso, but we'll worry about that later when we get to that. That's the, I don't know, I call it the exception to the rule, the oddball, the thing that occasionally crops up, but not very often. So we save it till last. So the idea is stereoisomers is a big, broad category, right? Enantiomers is a type of stereoisomer. Diastereomers are a type of isomer. So if I'm counting the number of stereoisomers, which I didn't even spell right, then, you know, if I have two chiral carbons, how many stereoisomers could I draw? And if I have three stereo or stereo, three chiral carbons, I can draw two cubed is eight, right? And if I have four stereoisomer centers, I can draw 16 stereoisomers. So, for instance, for carbohydrates, like I said earlier, carbohydrates, that's our next chapter. There actually are 16 different stereoisomers of a typical of a normal carbohydrate that we can talk about. Like I said, a lot of them we don't worry about. We can eliminate half of them immediately from our considerations, and we'll worry about that in chapter 27. But the idea is that we can draw lots and lots and lots of molecules. So let's pick a nice easy example. So given this, the first thing I want you to do is draw the enantiomers. And then I want you to draw the diastereomers. And so if I label this molecule as A, how many more molecules do you have to draw? How many chiral carbons are there? Two. So there should be four stereoisomers. So how many more do you have to draw? Three, because you're already given one, right? You have to kind of be given one in order to start the problem out. So the easiest way to do this is to remember that enantiomers are the, stereo are the mirror image. And so the easiest way to do it is to think, if I have a mirror here, then if I swap and put everything so that it's the exact mirror image of it, then that's an enantiomer, right? And I'll call that molecule B. Ugh. 
there's like no comfortable way to sit up here. You can stand around though, can't you? Or do you have to sit? Depends. Yeah. I think that they don't want them to make them too cushy because it would suck if your lifeguard is up there going. <laughs> Some people, when they're tired enough, can fall asleep in anything. My most embarrassing fall asleep moment was, so I finally, I'm in grad school, I picked the, the grad group that I wanted to work with, right? You know, and the boss is there and he's got a PhD and he's intimidating as hell. And there's all these other kids and they're all, everyone's smart and all that stuff. And I go to the, like, I don't think it was the very first group meeting, but I was so sleep deprived from staying up and doing homework and, you know, that sort of stuff that literally I'm like in the group meeting going like this. You know, and I'm trying to impress these people, right? And say, yeah, I'm smart, I belong here. And I'm sitting there like falling asleep because literally, I mean, they're talking about stuff that is like, I don't even understand the words they're using. Could you imagine if someone walked in here and we started talking about, and they had to sit and listen to an hour lecture on carboxylic acids, amides, amines, and all that stuff without having had this class for six weeks and knowing even what we're talking about? I mean, heck, it's hard enough for like Jess to stay awake and she knows what's going on. <coughs> We can pick on Jess because she's not here. And how many people want to vote if she, ooh, I should put this. If Jess comes and tells me the magic word, and Jasmine too, since we, we have to be fair, then they can get like 10 extra credit points, meaning they actually had to watch the video to figure out what the magic word is. Well, yeah, of course, see, if I say, you have to, if you tell me the magic word, you get 10 extra credit points, and I say the magic word right now, how many of you can talk to me right back? So you're all awake, right? Bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, which, I don't know what that means exactly. I mean, rabbits, are they wide awake? I don't know. Foxes. Or foxes, does that have bushy tails too and they're awake? I don't know. Anyway, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, I don't understand that, but whatever. It's like a tick on a dog. I don't even know. So what's the magic word? Abracadabra. Oh, that is a magic word. Exactly. So it's even pretty easy. So if Jasmine, if the first thing they do when they come up and see me is say abracadabra or Jess, then I'll give them the extra credit too. Now, that being said, don't tell them, okay? Because it's much more entertaining to see. Well, you better say it right now. I said it. Okay. There you go. 20 points. There you go. Okay. So that goes on the test. Maybe it does. What was the magic word discussed in class? Actually, but, but abracadabra is too easy of a magic word. They could guess that. They could guess it. We need to come up with something better. Uh, I won't remember that. <laughs> you might have a reason to remember that. I don't know. <laughs> okay, anyway, getting back on topic. So enantiomers are mirror images. Remember diastereomers... differ by the orientation of one chiral carbon. So the easiest way then to get the diastereomers is to simply rotate one chiral. Meaning instead of having HOH on both sides, I'm going to split it and go HOH. And so then that would be a diastereomer. And if I want to get the last molecule, then I can figure out simply the enantiomer of that diastereomer. Or if you really think about it, what we're doing is we're rotating one more time around a different one. And so we'll call that D. And so anytime we have a bunch of molecules and we label them like that, for instance, the enantiomers are A and B, but also C and D are mirror images, right? So those are representative enantiomers. And for the diastereomers, basically, if it's not an enantiomer, it must be A, or at least in this case, it's going to be a diastereomer. So for instance, A and C and A and D would be considered a pair of diastereomers. And B and C and B and D are also considered a pair of stereoisomers. Now, of all of the differences between enantiomers, diastereomers, and everything else, 
the one that we most care about is things that are enantiomers. Because remember, what's the, why are enantiomers important? How about that? We'll, we'll phrase it that way. Why do we care about the enantiomers? Why do we have this, ch this chapter on stereoisomerism? What's unique about uh, enantiomers that's important? Yeah, not so much that they're different biological. I mean, that certainly is important. All of the molecules are going to have different biological impacts to a certain extent. But the key part for us is that physically and chemically they're the same, right? So if they're physically and chemically the same, then it is awful hard to separate those molecules out in a chemistry lab. And you almost have to resort to, like I said, there's an entire kind of a branch of chemistry that deals with stereoisomerism and using special chemicals that are also stereoisomers in order to figure things out. And then there is, uh, you know, biological ways to do that too. If you generate these molecules using, you know, bacteria or something like that, then they usually come out as one stereoisomer. But not always, like for instance, THC is a good example. That comes out as the two different stereoisomers, one being the good one, and I should say two different enantiomers, one being the one that gives you the pleasant effects, and the other one, I don't even know what it does. Yeah, thalidomide, that again, but that was made with a chemical process. So the chemical process we know doesn't separate them out very well, but even biologically it can be kind of tough. You can actually get both being made. And then when we start talking about sugars, we're going to realize that they can interconvert sometimes, and that makes things even more complicated. Okay, so if I want to draw enantiomers, I draw mir <laughs> I know, that's why I'm... And then if I want to draw diastereomers, rotate, for instance, one of these, right? Oh, that wasn't the one I rotated. And then draw a mirror image of that one, and you get the other diastereomer. So now if I had three chiral carbons, how many molecules should I be able to draw? Three. If I had three chiral carbons. So for instance, if I make this molecule. And here's the trick with these sometimes, or I shouldn't say trick. The reason they're complicated is they all look alike after a while. So if that's molecule A, right, then if I draw a mirror image, I get an enantiomer, right? And then from that, there's three different ones that I can rotate, right? And so if I rotate, for instance, the orientation around the top one, then I get HOH, 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 O bond O, CH3. And if I rotate the orientation around the middle one, then let's see, that puts an HO there, an OH there. OH there, and a CH3. And then if I rotate the orientation around the bottom one, then I get an OH there, an OH there, and an OH there, right? And so if I'm labeling these, I got A, B, I'm going to have C, D, E, and F, and then G. Oops, I didn't leave much room for H, I guess, and H. Now, I'm not going to finish off drawing these, right? Because what would D be? Just a mirror image, right? And F over here is going to be, oh, let's, there we go. F is going to be a mirror image, and H is going to be a mirror image. So I'm not going to draw all those molecules. But the key is simply to remember that the enantiomer is simply the mirror image, and all the diastereomers, you just have to rotate or change the orientation around one of those chiral carbons. And then make a bunch more uh, mirror images so that you can tell them apart. Okay, we have two last things that we want to talk about then. We want to talk about meso compounds, and then we're going to talk about something called a racemic mixture to finish things off. So 
do I need to go back to finish drawing these or not? No. Okay, good. You guys are cruising along. So meso compounds are stereoisomers that contain chiral carbons. But there's something special. They are, they have a, an additional plane of symmetry. And therefore are superimposable on their mirror image. Yeah, so that's where I was, that little additional plane of symmetry that I was talking about earlier. So we said that the definition of a molecule that has, that's chiral is that it has chiral carbons in it and that those chiral carbons have four different things bonded to it, but there's no additional planes of symmetry. And so we're saving this concept of planes of symmetry until last because we kind of had to learn how to draw enantiomers and diastereomers and think about those before this would make sense, I think. And so meso compounds are stereoisomers that contain chiral carbons, but they have that additional plane of symmetry. And what that means is that they have that their mirror images are superimposable. And that means that they're not chiral, or that they're they're not optically active, I should say. So they don't rotate plane polarized light. So it is possible if you have a compound with more than one chiral carbon for the molecule itself to not be chiral. Does that kind of make sense? So in general, if something has a chiral carbon, it's going to be optically active. It's going to have stereoisomers and diastereomers and enantiomers and things like that. With the exception, the one exception being is if there's that additional plane of symmetry, then the molecule cannot have uh, or is not optically active. What happens is basically two chiral carbons cancel each other out. So in very special circumstances, they can cancel each other out. And probably the easiest example to see for that, and I'm going to start a new page for it just because I want to have lots of room to draw, is tartaric acid. And tartaric acid has the following formula. And I guess we'll just do it like this. We'll draw. So it's got a carboxylic acid functional group on both ends. And it's got an OH and an OH. And so if I number that, one, two, three, four, then carbons two and three are chiral. Therefore, we should have two to the N or four stereoisomers. So if I draw tartaric acid, it's got that carboxylic acid functional group at the top and bottom. O H O H H. And then of course if I draw its mirror image, what's the mirror image? It's just enantiomers, right? So if I've got molecule A and molecule B, there's a pair of enantiomers, right? I'll give you a second to finish writing this. Yep, last few things I can think of. I think I've answered most of the questions here. Okay, so now what's going to happen is if I want to draw the next one, 
I have to rotate the orientation of one of those groups, right? HO and H and HO and H. Now, what we have to pay attention to, and these are tricky. These are hard to see. You actually have to think really, really hard on some of them. This one I made really obvious because of the way I drew it. But do you see how the top and the bottom are mirror images of that molecule? So this is a plane of symmetry. And because I can take that molecule and literally fold it on, so fold it on top of itself or fold it in half, then what that means is that the mirror image of this molecule would be the same molecule. And this is what we call meso, meaning for a meso compound there is no enantiomer because it's the same molecule or because it's superimposable on itself. And so what that means is that in this case there's really only three stereoisomers. Meaning if I kept track of things that are enantiomers, <coughs> diastereomers, that's weird. My computer just like the fan turned on blowing hot air. Hopefully this doesn't overheat and like nuke. Because it would really suck to have to give this lecture for Jess and Jasmine. And then miso. For instance, A and B are enantiomers to each other, right? Because they're mirror images. And if I label this molecule over here as C, then A and C and B and C are diastereomers because they're just different by the rotation around one of those. And then C is what we call a meso compound, meaning it doesn't have a pair. There's not another molecule that's associated with it. And so you have to be aware of it. So if you have to label things that are enantiomers, diastereomers, and meso compounds, enantiomers are pretty easy. That's just a bunch of mirror images. Diastereomers are just rotating one thing. To check and see if something's meso, you have to check and see if it has an additional plane of symmetry. So if I looked on, say, molecule A and B, notice that if I tried to draw another plane of symmetry, those things are different, right? So there's obviously no plane of symmetry there. If I draw this, again, there's a difference there, so there's no plane of symmetry, right? But, you know, in this molecule, that's the same. In this molecule, that's the same. And then the OH, or the carboxylic acid functional groups are the same, right? So when you're looking at molecules and being asked to do things like that, look at molecules and say, do they look like they could be diester or uh, have an additional plane of symmetry because of having the same set of functional groups on each carbon? Notice that each carbon here has an OH and H and a carboxylic acid functional group, right? And so if they have all the same functional groups on that carbon, you should highly suspect that you've got a meso compound. So for example, let's draw something like this. Actually, let's mix it up. Let's make this an aldehyde. We'll make this an aldehyde. We'll make this an H, a chlorine, a chlorine, and an H. And it's kind of drawn funky because I'm just making up something off the top of my head. I guess we could make it a bromine in there somewhere or not. So I'm going to call this molecule A, right? Now we should immediately look at that. Now, well, okay, let's, let's hold off a sec. So if I'm looking at compound A and I'm being told, you know, I need to draw all the enantiomers, diastereomers, and uh, meso compounds and identify them and stuff like that, one of the things I should look at is say, well, does it have a mirror image? No. Now you have to be careful, though, because one thing that you should realize is that notice that I've got the same three functional groups on the top and the same three functional groups on the bottom, right? And so depending upon how I draw this, it can be confusing. Notice that what happens if I swap these two groups?
like that, right? This is definitely miso, right? Because here there's clearly that plane of symmetry, right? And so I'm going to call this molecule B since it's the second one I drew. Now, because I made one swap, is that the same molecule or a different molecule? Different. Right. So the first molecule A is not miso, right? But B is miso. And then if I drew the mirror image, and since I didn't leave enough room to draw it, I'll just sketch it down here. You know, if I put the double bond there, and let's see, I've got to put an H, a carbonyl, and a chlorine, and a chlorine, and an H like that, then molecule C is, you know, not miso either, right? And so, depending upon how the molecule is drawn, if you can rearrange it, if you can make two swaps and make it look miso, then guess what? It really is miso. Yeah. Do you take that off of the original one or off of the mirrored one? You know what I'm saying? So, like. It doesn't matter which one you would do it from. These are two different molecules, right? Yeah. And so, if I make one swap here to get over there, I, sh I should not be able to make an even number of swaps and get there. It should have to be an odd number, right? because they would be different molecules too. So remember, if molecules are really different, you won't be able to make one swap and get to the same molecule. You'll have to make an even number. The other thing, I guess, to point out that I, I don't know, seems silly to me, but like for instance is, you know, if I have a molecule that looks like this, so I've got a bromine, a bromine, a chlorine, a chlor oh, an iodine, an iodine, and a chlorine. Actually, here, let's do this. Now, is that the one that's certainly this is going to have a plane of symmetry because you've got the iodine, bromine, and chlorine the same on both of them, right? Is this the one that's miso, though, or is this the one that's not? I don't know. I just randomly put the stuff on there, right? Uh, what I want to illustrate is that when you're swapping things, is it possible to swap this? and this. No, they're on the same carbon, right? Or I'm, I mean, they're on different carbons. So when we say you can swap things, if I take a big complicated molecule like that, I'm saying I can swap this and that because they're on the same carbon, right? And that's just a rotation of the molecule itself. I can't take something off of there and put it down here because now it's a different molecule entirely. So when you're making your swaps, make sure the swaps are, you know, between things that are on the same carbons. It seems like silly to have to mention it, but someone always seems to make those swaps wherever they want. And then they get all the iodines on one, all the bromines on another, or something weird like that. And it's like, no, that's just silly. OK, one last topic to talk about. So we've got all these different types of stereoisomers and various things like that. And one of the things that we should recognize is that, in general, in chemistry, we have what we call a racemic mixture. And that is a mixture of stereoisomers that contain pairs of enantiomers. So a mixture of enantiomers. And the reason we have that is because they have the same melting point, or same, well, let's do it this way, same physical and chemical characteristics. Character. Ugh. And therefore, we can't separate them or cannot easily separate. And see, this is one of those things that's funny. Way back when they first discovered all these stereoisomers and stuff, they, they literally defined enantiomers as they have different chemical properties, right? Well, guess what? Technically, or I mean, they have the same chemical properties. Technically, they do have different chemical properties. If you have what's called a stereoisomer reagent, meaning it's a reagent that's only one stereoisomer, you can actually use that in a carefully crafted reaction to separate out enantiomers. So technically, enantiomers have different chemical reactions. But it's in such a small, specialized case that, like I said, anything we do in our lab, it ain't happening. So what that means is that a racemic mixture is optically inactive. And that's because the, the, 
the stereo or the enantiomers cancel each other out. Enantiomers cancel each other out. So but biologically we can separate and there's a few molecules where both isomers are used, although usually only one isomer is used. For instance, if I have plus lactic acid, then that's what's found in human muscles. It's and it's um, that, uh, what do you, uh, that's what makes your muscles feel tired, right? We'll talk about lactic acid in a lot more detail in the bioenergetics chapter and realize that it's a very important biological molecule because it allows us to trans... Has Tom talked about it? I know you guys have. Mm -hmm. Meaning, they talked about la yeah. lactic yeah. acid plus and minus mol or, uh, bacteria. Okay, yeah. if I have the minus version of lactic acid, that's actually what's produced by bacteria and it's used to sour milk. I don't know why anyone wants to make milk sour. I like my milk as milk. I'm not a big fan of sour cream. I'll bet. I'll bet. I actually remember one time I went home over Christmas for like three weeks and I left a gallon of milk sitting in the refrigerator and I came back and it was like chunky and stuff. I heard that too. Yeah, you always got to take a little whiff. The trouble is, is once, you've, once, you, once you once you realize it's sour, then every time you test it, you can't even tell the difference between non-sour milk and sour milk. You're sort of always like got that, I'm not sure. That's why I always drink the cranberry juice. So far, they haven't had rancid cranberry juice. Which is probably a little bit excessive because there's a lot of and sugar in that. Anyway, uh, some other examples of things that biologically are important. is, of course, we've talked about thalidomide, right? And I don't know for the rest of these whether the, it's the plus or the minus that does it, but this controls morning sickness. And one of them causes birth defects. Um, there's a lot of other medications that are like that that have both good and bad in that, bleh, bad ones. You, have you guys heard of Lopressor? I'm guessing none of you are on it. Um, some of your parents might be. That's a blood pressure medicine. Um, Sudafed, most people have heard of that. What's that used for? Nasal decongestant and meth. Um, it's one of, I think, I. Th I don't know. It's been a while since I even cared about making drugs and stuff, but I thought for some reason Sudafed was <laughs> thought about making it, not making it. Well, technically, I've made drugs before. I've made aspirin. Aspirin's a drug. I've made that in lab before. I certainly would never eat it, but um, we can make it. We used to do that lab here, but it's kind of boring, and you should do it in a hood, so we're not going to do it this year. L-dopamine. Oops, L dope. Dope. I mean, is another example. And one that some of you might be on or should be on Ritalin. That is a chemical compound that additionally has stereoisomers. And of course, our favorite one, THC. So, I got to be honest. In your day-to-day -day life, do you need to know this stuff? No. Not really. But is it kind of nice or maybe useful in the back of your mind to realize that anytime you take a drug, you should be asking yourself, how easy is it for him to screw this up? 
or like I, I just read an article this morning that they're thinking that, uh, you know, those Roundup resistant crops, uh, they that Roundup might be linked to a very rare form of liver disorder. So you know, it seems like a lot of people are getting this very rare liver disorder, and the most thing the thing they have in common is they tend to be farmers that use Roundup. Otherwise, there's not much in common between them, or have lived in an area that you know uses it heavily. So, chemistry and definitely biology are very, very, very complicated. So I guess we'll end here today. I don't really feel like starting in in chapter 27. So let's say that for Tuesday, homework 26 B, C, and D are due. And it sounds like a lot, but I divided it up into lots of little chunks. And I don't think it's too much. And maybe we talked a little slow the first day. I don't know. And then what we're looking at next week is we're going to start in on chapter 27, chapter 27. We're going to have a lab. That lab is might be talking about IR. It might be the carbohydrate lab. Oops. Don't crash on me. Oh, never mind. Well, we won't finish putting up the rest of our schedule. You'll just have to listen to it if you watch the tape again. But I don't think we have class on Friday. Don't quote me on it, though. Let me make sure my meeting really is there. And what that means is that when we come back that first week back, we'll probably have a day of Chapter 27 and finish up the lecture. And then we'll have a review session. And we might have a test as early as Thursday when we come back. Although I'm guessing I'll probably put it off till Friday or the following week. So the tough thing about spring break always is you got to be careful to not forget.